been a while since I've been up here. I'm enjoying it. Thank you. If you've ever experienced a miracle, a miracle of healing, who or what would get the credit? Some of us have seen and experienced medical miracles, and in that case, science gets the credit. Some people have faith in folk medicine and home remedies, and in that case, maybe eating kale every day gets the credit. Or the body's health healing abilities, which are undeniably miraculous, right? Your own self-discipline, or maybe just luck. But if someone came along and, say, healed a broken bone that you had in a matter of moments, and he told you that he got his power from God, what would you think? Would you think he was crazy? Or would you believe him? What if you were only a witness to this miracle? Belief would be a little harder then, wouldn't it? What if you already knew the healer and actively disliked him? Maybe you knew that he voted differently from you in the last election, or maybe he had offended you in the past. Wouldn't it be easier to disregard this healing and maybe even twist it into something else, something negative? Our biases get in the way of the truth. As we've been working our way through the Gospel of John in this sermon series, we've been shown what John believes about Jesus, the truth of his identity. And this Gospel very directly answers the question of who Jesus is. The question of Jesus' identity is part of every story, every conversation that gets recorded, every argument that Jesus has with the religious leaders of his day. And in John chapter 9, our scripture for today, Jesus performs a miracle, and it is verified by every single witness, even by those who oppose him. If you believe only God can do these kinds of miracles, the question of Jesus' identity should be answered by this story. But even for those who were right there, who saw exactly what happened, the answer didn't seem obvious. So let's read from John 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples, he being Jesus, sorry. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I was just talking about biases, and one came up right here, didn't it? Somebody must have sinned if, so, if this man was blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents? If you believe in a God who is all-powerful, all-loving, and all-fair, one way of getting around questions like this, of someone being born blind, is that it only seems unfair, but actually isn't. It's really a punishment for some secret sin, which is great if you're not the one going through the punishment. But Jesus doesn't believe in karma. Yes, actions do have consequences. Good things often produce good things. Bad things often re result from bad actions, but not necessarily. Sometimes you do someone a kindness and you don't get any thanks. Sometimes a drunk driver gets home safely with no accident. Her bad behavior is not punished. And I'm glad that Jesus lets us know that every problem we have isn't necessarily our own fault. Bad things happen to good people. But I confess that the rest of Jesus' answer here has always kind of confused me. Even though he says that neither the man nor his, nor his parents sinned, which makes sense, the following explanation is difficult, and maybe this has bothered you too. So I dug a little deeper. The NIV translation, New International Version translation that we use here, reads, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, comma, but this happened to, so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Doesn't that sound like God made this man suffer so that God himself would be glorified? That doesn't seem right. Would God inflict pain on someone just to glorify himself? Well, because I did my digging, I learned that the purpose clause, they call it, of verse 3, so that the works of God, can just as well be applied to verse 4, 
instead, and many scholars think it should, and then it would translate a little differently. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, period. But so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is still day. I find that a little more satisfying. I don't think the purpose clause shows that Jesus must work so that God's glory may be displayed in this man's life. God hadn't made the man blind in order to show his glory. Instead, God sent Jesus to do these works of healing in order to show God's glory. Jesus' work must not be interrupted, he says, because he is the light that illumines the day, and night is coming when he won't be there anymore, and he won't be doing any more miracles. So, as I said, this makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it helps you. Going on. After seeing this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. What an astonishing thing this must have been for those who witnessed it. Here was someone they knew had been blind from birth, walking around without help, able to see. These neighbors have questions, right? In fact, they barely recognize him. They asked their questions, he explained what happened, and that the man they called Jesus had done it. But that didn't seem like enough, especially when he wasn't able to produce Jesus. So they went to their religious leaders, the Pharisees. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes who were, that were opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. So the Pharisees, these religious leaders, questioned this man. But the most important point is said right at the beginning. They already knew that the man had been healed on the Sabbath. The Pharisees are divided about who Jesus could be because of this. Some said, this man is not from God. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So notice that when the neighbors questioned him, the blind man said he was healed by the man they called Jesus. And when the Pharisees questioned him, he says, he is a prophet. Well, now the Pharisees have more questions. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they ask? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. So the parents, Pharisees call on the man's parents, and they're not able or even willing to say very much. They don't want to be thrown out of the synagogue. Let's read the last part of this passage. His parents said, said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that was why the parents said, he is of age, ask him. If they had been thrown out of the synagogue, they would have been cut off completely from their community. There was no other place of worship just down the street where they would be welcome. So, it seems a little bit cowardly to me, but their son was already begging on the street to make a living, so maybe they weren't very close. I don't know. Notice again, as we progress through these witnesses, Jesus is first the man they called Jesus, then the blind man calls him a prophet, and now the man's parents aren't willing to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, but it had clearly occurred to them that he might be. 
Here's, always some, here's something to always keep in mind in a situation like this. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. That's 1 John 4, 18. If we are people of faith, we don't need to be afraid of the truth. Well then, the Pharisees do turn back to the blind man. A second time, they summon the man who had been blind. Give glory to God and by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Ooh, that's a burn. The Pharisees are desperate for this man to deny Jesus. Do you remember when we talked about John chapter 5? Jesus healed a man beside the pool in Beth Bethesda, who, when he found out who healed him, had betrayed Jesus to the authorities. This man is quite different. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then he really goes for the jugular. Do you want to be his disciples too? This formerly blind man is not afraid of the consequences of becoming Jesus' disciple. In fact, he stakes his claim so boldly he does it right in front of Jesus' enemies. And then what else happens? What's next? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. Oops. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. I love this guy. <laughs> He's smart. And he outlines his argument almost like he's Aristotle, who lived 300 years before. Did you ever take philosophy in high school or college and learn about syllogisms? I think this is how it would go. Don't quote me on this. Proposition one, only God can perform miracles. Proposition two, Jesus performed a miracle. Conclusion, therefore, God worked through Jesus. Argument two, we start with the conclusion from argument one. God worked through Jesus. God doesn't work through sinners. Therefore, Jesus isn't a sinner. In fact, he must come from God. Now, I do hope that there are no real philosophers here <laughs> because this not be, may not be perfectly stated. And the second part of that final conclusion in parentheses probably needs its own syllogism. But I think you see the logic here. We learn from this healed man that when we're surrounded by fear and anger, the only way through is to glimpse whatever we can see of Jesus, to follow him out of the dark and into the light. All that's left for the Pharisees to do is go to that other argument that you hear about when you take a philosophy class, the ad hominem argument, which I hope would have appalled Aristotle. They insult the man who's making the argument. Oh well, you were steeped in sin at birth. And that is, remember, exactly the opposite of what Jesus said at the beginning. He said, remember, neither his sin nor his parents' sin caused his blindness. Going on. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus found this man, again, just like he found the man he had, that he had healed at the pool of Bethesda. And remember with that man, there was no conversation recorded. With that one, Jesus just said, go and sin no more. But here, he gives this healed blind man the opportunity to believe in him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the response is eager. Tell me who he is so that I may believe in him. What a model of faith this man is. He already believed in the miracle, of course. It happened to him. Now he understands its full meaning and who it was who performed it. So 
again, Jesus got in this man's mind from being the man they called Jesus to being a prophet, to being the Messiah, and now the Son of Man, which I hope you recall is talked about in the book of Daniel and is equal to God himself. And the man worshipped him. Oh, and I should say, in the verse 36, he calls Jesus Sir. And then at the end, he calls him Lord. Things have changed for him, obviously, and I think that's beautiful. Throughout this book, John has talked about how Jesus is the light. From the very, very beginning, he said that. And sometimes it takes a moment, or a day, or a week, or maybe even longer, after the light goes on, or after we step into the light, for us to realize exactly what we're seeing. Do you find that's true? Maybe you've had a certain perspective on God, or on Jesus, or on the church for quite a while. Do you truly believe in Jesus, and what would it mean if you did? Would anything change for you? And I think we all have our eyes opened over time. The Pharisees, however, with all their biases, have come forward to judge both the man and Jesus. In the end, Jesus judges them. Once again, we can find a parallel to that story of the man by the pool in Bethesda. That happened on a Sabbath, too. And remember, the Pharisees tried to put Jesus on trial, and instead he judged them. And that same thing happens here. Jesus' opponents can physically see, but they are spiritually blind. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Jesus says that the most serious condition these Pharisees have is that they believe that they're innocent. They understand fully the point Jesus is making, and they reject it. Because they claim they can see, that makes their guilt even worse by confirming their position against Jesus. The Pharisees and the blind man have each stood in the light, and we do see their true spiritual condition, and that comes back to what we read in John chapter 3 several weeks ago. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. We will all someday be seen in the light. And I hope that we will choose right now to live by the truth and come into the light at this moment. And that means Jesus. Only by going back to Jesus over and over again can we be sure that we're standing alongside the healed blind man in his newfound faith and openness to God's light. Then we too can say, One thing I do know, once I was blind, but now I can see. Amen.